Why are you taking video of yourself? Um, because I'm. It's part of the movie that I make. Okay. Hi everyone. I'm Erin, and this is my friend Eva. Can you say hi, Eva. Hi, Eva. <laughs> Eva's your average three-year-old. She likes to create and play and imagine and explore and run around. Like, a lot of running, <laughs> which would be a nightmare for your average preschool. But this isn't an average preschool. There are no desks, no fluorescent lights, and no building whatsoever. There's a new movement of outdoor preschools sprouting up around the country, and it might be the wave of the future. Hey everyone, I'm Erin, and I'm interested in seeing what the future of the outdoors looks like. Hi everyone, I just got to Seattle. I love this beautiful city, mountains, and the ocean, but uh, of course it is still a city, so you have concrete and indoor spaces, but there are some parents and preschoolers who are wanting to make sure they stop and smell the roses, or know the roses closer, like more than just seeing them. Anyway, check out what I mean. It's hard to think about your own work in such a noisy, you couldn't learn very much here. Let's visit another room. It's so quiet. A good room to work in, to learn in. So let's back up. Knowledge has been passed down outdoors since time immemorial. But over time, we've moved children's education from the outdoors to inside four walls and under fluorescent lights. However, it surprised me to learn that this trend of getting children's education back outdoors was started back in the 50s. We first started to see nature being incorporated into a curriculum in Denmark. And soon, mothers begin organizing schools that bust their children from Copenhagen to the countryside. But it took a long time for this to catch on in the States. In fact, it wasn't until 2010 that these outdoor schools really started to show up. And now there are more and more. In 2016, there were 150 nature-based preschools and kindergartens across the country. And then just one year later, there was a full 100 more. Now there are nearly 500, which means more than 10,000 children are enrolled in these programs. These new schools are called nature preschools or forest preschools and are based entirely on the idea of getting kids to learn through nature as the organizing principle of the programs. So where did this idea come from, and why is the trend growing so fast? Well, a lot of people point to Richard Louvre as one point of inspiration in the U.S. Richard has been writing books on nature and children for over 20 years. His book Last Child in the Woods speaks specifically about where our future is heading and why it's so important for children to connect with their environment. So I wanted to spend some time with Richard at his house in California to learn more about what he has seen. So obviously the book is about the importance of children connecting to nature. Um, and this went on to be a bestseller. People love this topic. Why do you think the book and the topic took off? Uh, I noticed in my interviews with families that something profound was changing in the relationship between children and nature. The parents knew it. Again, they, didn't, they couldn't quite describe it, but they didn't understand why their kids weren't interested in going outside. As one little boy said, uh, I prefer playing indoors because that's where all the electrical outlets are. Right, I, I was reading that in Last yeah. Child in the Woods. I heard that again and again. And finally, the academic world began to pay attention to it because now there is scientific evidence that was backing that idea. What Richard saw was echoed in many other studies, like how today's kids aged 6 through 11 spend an average of seven and a half hours a day being inactive. And of kids ages 9 through 13, only about 6% of them will go out and play on their own. Instead, the average American child today spends up to nine hours digitally connected. Which maybe sounds like a bunch of folks saying, kids these days and back in my day, but maybe there's a warning in what we're hearing. Nature deficit disorder, while it's not a known medical diagnosis, maybe it should be, but it's not that opens the conversation about what happens when we are disconnected as a species and as individuals from the rest of the natural world. What happens to our health? What happens to our 
physical health, our psychological health, and our spiritual health. Richard believes that the more kids are outside, the more they will be grounded and the more healthy they will be mentally and physically. And he might be right. One study found that low access to residential green space can be connected to psychiatric disorders from adolescence into adulthood. And another study found that increased exposure to nature decreases or can reduce ADHD symptoms. Now, getting your kids outside today sounds like a fun, cool thing to do. But what about grades and learning and the alphabet? What do these schools even do? How do they learn? Okay, this is Tiny Trees Preschool, and we're only about five minutes from major Seattle freeways, but in here, I feel completely engulfed. So I'm Kelly Morrill. I am the executive director of Tiny Trees. So we're different in that we're outdoor. We don't have walls, so all of our children are in public classrooms. So children at Tiny Trees are learning, um, you know, they're learning about science, they're learning about resilience, they're learning about um, self-regulation. Um, they're learning great social skills and even academics all in an outside environment just by playing and engaging with nature and with each other um, and through the facilitation of the teachers. I wanted to talk to some of the parents at this school to see what they really think. I think just being able to be outside and moving their bodies all the time with all of their little friends and learning from their teachers outdoors has been so much better than being inside all day would have been for them. With this, the kids are up and around and they're not learning that they're supposed to be sedentary and they're not getting yelled at to stay in chairs and it's like they have to stay in the area but they're allowed to wiggle. And that's how we're supposed to be, naturally. But the real question is, does this work? Or will kids be staring down their SATs only remembering what tree is outside the window? For that, we turn to the researchers. Dr. Tandon has done research on kids in the outdoors when it comes to learning and physical health. Physical activity is important for so many reasons. There's the obvious ones like a healthy weight status, healthy heart, bones, and all that. Um, but getting enough physical activity can also be important for things like mental health and um, even learning and, and academic performance. One strategy for getting kids more active is to have them be outdoors more. So research suggests that when kids are outdoors, they are running around more, they're moving more. So how do we get kids outdoors, whether they're in preschool, or you know, at school during recess, PE activities, and in their neighborhoods. So having access to parks um, close by and that feel safe enough for, for kids and families to be in. Well, this is a feel good story, isn't it? Let's make all schools outdoor schools. Kids know the names of plants. They wanna befriend slugs. Well, there are some barriers to outdoor schools, and one of them is permits. In Chicago, one school is being closed because it can't maintain a permit. The Child Care Act of 1969 requires that preschools be in a physical facility, something that doesn't really flow with the whole idea of forest schools. Another major roadblock is that laws require preschools to be secure from the public. And since these schools are in public parks, technically anyone could march on through. One critique of these programs is that historically they've been accessible largely only to white upper middle class populations. When people think about outdoor preschool, they're thinking about little white kids running around in the forest. It's a very niche space to exist in. And so, you know, within that space, you would want to see the children who are in those spaces at least being representative of the demographics of the areas that they're living in. And so that means that we need to become better community members. We need to be talking to people more. We need to be listening to people more and figuring out how we can do our best. That means that we come back and then we're reflective and we figure out what we need to do to make sure that when we do partner with someone in the future, you know, we're being as thoughtful as we can. If states aren't providing permits, it can be hard to get a grant in order to assist lower income households. Colorado and Washington are the only states as of now that are expanding the law so that licenses can exist for forest schools like Tiny Trees. All to say, there is still a ways to go in getting the class demographics to accurately reflect the diversity of the places where they exist. Cedar, maple, hemlock. 
After spending my whole day with these kids, it really seems like an outdoor focus for our schools is something we should be fighting for. There's growing awareness that um, being outside in nature is, the, is a great place to learn about everything, not just about science, not just about nature. Partly because it stimulates more of our senses than we get from a computer. Our kids are spending that much time blocking out those human senses. Isn't that the very definition of being less alive? The really cool thing about doing preschool outside is that we're not confined by walls. We are able to get our inspiration from everything that's happening in the park. Um, so the learning is 100% relevant to them and to what they're experiencing every day. And it's pretty awesome. The added benefit here is not just that the kids learn, but that they build a connection to nature that lasts into their adult years and maybe that they teach their parents a thing or two about caring for the planet. I hope that it will always be important to them to be a steward for the environment. I hope that having like that really solid base of that from preschool that it'll just carry throughout their life and they'll always come back to that. As the next generation grows up in a world that's increasingly digital and connected, maybe it's time to reevaluate our education system and use it as a tool to reconnect us with our natural habitat. And even though there aren't walls or ceilings, kids are still learning. And after spending the day here outside, playing in the mud and singing songs, all I know is this is the education I wish I had, and maybe the one I still need. A stinging nettle is not good. A stinging nettle is not good. Yeah. No. It's, it's just, it stays there for a long time and we knew it, it, it. Oh. Hey everybody, thank you so much for watching. We had a ton of fun hanging out with these kiddos. They are hilarious. And we also just wanted to let you know that you may have noticed a little blurb on one of the corners here throughout today's episode. That's a land acknowledgement. We want to acknowledge the land that we're on. This is also feedback that we got from you, and we totally agree. So you're going to see that from now on so that we're acknowledging whose traditional homeland we are filming on. As always, let us know if you have more feedback in the comments, and we'll see you next time.